So today, we'll continue our series. We have been doing a series, and I'd like to give background of this series. Everything that we do here, there's a prophetic basis for them. The word of the Lord had come to evaluate us in these recent times to check our faith level, to see how many of us believe the promise and the declaration of God for the season and the hour. One of the things that God has been speaking to us is this, is the word for the season is winter. Now, the winter is not necessarily God's plan, but happens to be the situation of the times that we are living in. I hope that one day I'll be able to teach about times and seasons so that we can understand why times and seasons, how they work. The enemy's plan is always to distort times and seasons. The Bible says in the book of uh, Daniel that the enemy tries to change the times and the seasons. In a literal sense, to give you an example of what that means, I like to use the story of a man. I can't remember the man's name anymore now. But it's a story I read many years ago in a daily devotional of this man who used to say, whenever they invite him to church, he would say, I will come when winter enters April. So, winter does not happen in April, so it never comes. However, there was one time that the winter season extended so long it entered into April. And this guy was in church that day. But he was in a casket. He had died. It was the, it's it's called the sense of humor of God. God is divine humor. God wanted to, you want to mock me, I will mock you. He still in that church doing an April winter, but this time he was in a casket. So that April is supposed to be what summer. That is the time. But what season were they experiencing? They were experiencing winter. That's the meaning of times and season. So God's idea and God's plan is to make sure the times align with the seasons and that the seasons align with the time. But the devil wants to alter times and seasons. So in a physical, literal sense, that is an example of what it will look like. When times and seasons are changed, where summer will experience what winter. So what time of the year is it? You will still call it what? Summer. But what season were they experiencing? They were experiencing winter. So in this season, God told us that in the spirit realm over the nations of the earth, the devil has released a season of winter. Instead of the sun of righteousness to arise with healing in his wings over the nation, the enemy has spread and open the gate of winter. And the Lord has said so many other things about this season. He has spoken about the end of the judgment cycle of Nigeria and the beginning of the new era of Nigeria. He has spoken about the rise of a new breed without greed. He has spoken about the rise of the 16th president. spoken about so many things in that season. And there's doubt, fear, and unbelief. And the Lord is saying, where is your faith? Do you really believe? So that evaluation is what we are trying to address. We're not trying to impose any prophetic word on anybody because there's somebody passed out in prophetic word that God has given people individually to. God has said you will prosper. God said you will progress. God said you'll be great. And some people doubt it. God has told them that there's a ministry and assignment committed to you. And people doubt that. And God is saying, where is your faith? So this season, what we are doing is now teaching about faith because I have seen people who believed and did not know they believed Seeing people who did not believe and thought that they believed. A perfect example in scripture is the Pharisees. They were the custodians of scripture. They carried the scripture every day, but they stoned the Messiah to death. They were the ones who sent him to the cross. Are you following this? So for this reason, if you ask the Pharisees, do you believe in the Messiah? They'll say, yes. We are the ones preparing for him. They had created an institution and waited for him to come and become leader of that institution. But when the Messiah came, they rejected it. They were the ones, the scripture says, these are the builders who rejected the cornerstone. That what Christ used them to explain that scripture. So you are the builders who reject me, the stone. So it's a different thing if they were not builders, say we don't deal with stone. No, you are the ones who, your profession is dealing with stone, building stones. Then the original building stone came, you still tossed it out the window. So if you had asked these people, do you believe? They would have said yes. But the verdict of heaven said no. 
So for that reason, we need to calibrate this faith. And I'm not rushing it. Everything I'm preaching, I can preach it in one message. Because the first message I preached was what? Test of faith. And what is a test of faith? Who remembers the test of faith? Patience. He who believes will not act hastily. He who believes will not, will not act hastily. That is the test of faith. Test of faith is not result. We'll come to that on that day. Test of faith is not power. Test of faith is not all those things. You can have all those things and still fail the test of faith. The test of faith is patience. How many of you waited for the word of the Lord? He says, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. Say, so you see, therefore you believe. In other words, that's not faith. That's sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Immediately it is seen, it's no longer faith. And some people are waiting to see. Let, let us see first. So that is the prophetic background to our message. We have some scriptures that we have outlined as our formal text of scripture. And we'll read it, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first, and also for the Greeks. For in it, that is the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And I explained this thing extensively the last time. And one part I don't want you to forget is that the same way we need oxygen as humans to live, the just needs faith to live. So faith is not something you do, you use at a particular point in time and then put shelf off and say, okay, later on I'll come back to it. It's like oxygen. You use it every now and then. You use every single day of your life. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 to 4 is where the scripture originated from. And we went there also, and we'll go there again to read it. He says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will what? Not vary. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. You can't live by the faith of somebody else. You must live by your own faith. They just shall live by what? His faith. Very important. We saw that this scripture came before, after what? A vision. It says the vision is on an appointed time. That's the reason you need faith. That's the background of that scripture. That you are promises of God that were long in the waiting. And God was saying, if you wait for it, then you are living by faith. Because there are things that God will promise you and say to you that will take time. It will take process. And lastly, we looked at the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37 to 39. Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 37 to 39. It says, for yet a little while. So this is Paul's, or rather, whoever the writer of Hebrews is. The Hebrews account of that same scripture in Habakkuk. We are seeing, because when they write it in the New Testament, most times they edit some things prophetically, to give you a glimpse that you have not seen before. So he says, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. What was coming and will not tarry before in the book of Habakkuk, it was it. And what was it? It was the vision. The vision will come and will not tarry. Now he now says, he that is coming will come and will not tarry. In other words, the he here is Jesus. The vision has always been about Jesus. So, Habakkuk was waiting for a realization of something in his time that would manifest as political deliverance. And God said, it will come. But not now. Jesus is still on his way. Just believe. Did Habakkuk see Jesus Christ before he died? No. Oh. But did he believe? Yes. His faith was not determined by seeing it, but by believing it. Very important. This is what the nature of and characteristic of faith. This is how we test our faith. That we are patient to wait on the Lord. You've heard about people who were waiting for the fruit of the womb. And when it was not coming forth, 
they went to Babalao. That is a person who has run out of faith. Some people, they go and maybe they find out some way, somehow, or assume, maybe my husband is one that's not able to perform. They don't go and meet somebody else. Sometimes it's the husband that will now say, she will not kill me. Go and meet another man. It has happened. In this nation, it has happened. It's the man that's encouraging the wife to go and meet another person to get her pregnant, to remove shame from himself. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. So today's message is about the acts of faith. What practical actions can we take? How practical steps can we take to show our faith? You remember the scripture says the just shall live by faith? Since this is our lifestyle, it means that there are certain things that should show forth in us. As the scripture says, faith without works is death. So we want to examine certain actions, certain acts that we must embrace to prove our faith. Because so many of us believe but don't know what to do. We believe emotionally. We believe psychologically. That thing you said, that sounds true. I will wait for it to come to pass. And most times, the word will come to pass and you'll be like the Pharisee that will execute it. The Pharisees, they were waiting for the Messiah, were they not? They were waiting for it. They were studying the scriptures on a daily basis. So waiting is not an act of faith. Oh, let us wait on the Lord. <laughs> it's not an act of faith. Delete it from your lexicon of faith. So what then are the acts of faith? Number one, it's called planning. Now, there's no, they don't go in any particular order. Okay, I choose to talk about planning first because planning touched me so much. I said, let me talk about planning first. Planning is an act of faith. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 5. It says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty. But those, who, but those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. Remember? What the Bible says about he who believes he will not act hastily. So he's telling you who he is acting hastily leads to poverty. But instead of walking hastily, what do you do? You plan. Planning will take time. So when the Lord gives you a word, start making plans towards it. You see, we have some examples in Scripture I would like to share with us. God told Joshua, I'll give you the land of Canaan. Go and conquer it. Be strong and courageous. That's chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and courageous. Go and conquer the land. It's given to you. Chapter 2 verse 1. What does Joshua say? He sent two spies. Go and spy out the land. Why is he going to spy out? God has given you the land. Just go blind now. Tie blindfold and just go and be killing everybody and take the land. No, they, they had a plan. They had to strategize. If you go and study military... Uh, strategies, one of the first things established in military warfare is communication. And one of the first things that is destabilized in the opponent's camp is what? Communication. So, for instance, if you go around Nigeria and you notice that there is a network problem, just know that a coup wants to happen. You can't call any because immediately they do that. The person in Asoro can call chief of uh, staff or chief. He can't call anybody. So, you are helpless. That's the first thing they destabilize. Communication. So the first thing you will also establish is what? Communication. I remember one beautiful story about, I think it was World War II. So the military had to create a code of communication for a one-day mission. I don't know if it was a one-day mission, but they had one day to learn the code. They created the code. They had one day to memorize the code. And then going to battlefield and be using the code to communicate. So that even if the enemy were to intercept it, the enemy will need to decode it first before they will not know what you are saying. They went for that war. Remember, one day to memorize code. It's like learning a new language in one day. They did it and they succeeded. Years later, there was a training in Pentagon and they sent that same code to a group of people to master. They gave them one week holiday with pay it. They came back after and they had not memorized the code. Why? Their lives were not at stake. 
Most of us don't take the word of the Lord as our life. So one week or one year, we don't learn, we don't master, we don't understand anything. But those who have received the word will have a plan. Have you noticed that every time God gave them a building project, the Ark of Noah, the Tabernacle of Moses, the, tabana, the Temple of Solomon, he gave them a building plan. He didn't just tell them, don't be throwing stones, it will not, a house will not appear. He gave them measurement. There is a plan that you must follow. God said, I will be the best neurosurgeon. I will wait for it. So, so what medical school do you go to? Medical school, when God is going to give me? No, 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 no. So I don't even need to read book. He was, he was put it in my head. I remember one day I was talking to my disciples. It was, uh, I don't know if it was Paul I was talking to and, and Uyi was listening in or the other way around. And I was talking about wisdom. So when God gives you wisdom, when God tells you I'm giving you wisdom, the next thing to go is go and read. Do you understand? It's a seed. You need to water it through reading. You begin to water that seed. That's your plan to get there. I remember when God was imparting me with my first dose of wisdom. I was a teenager. And in that vision, I saw myself. I was taking a journey on a barbed wire with bare hands. And the dark cloud of the Lord appeared at the end of that barbed wire. And he began to say, Adams, continue. You can do it. You can do it. When you get to the end of this journey, I will reward you with wisdom. In that time, I used to call myself very foolish. I knew I was foolish. But do you know what? By the time that process began to wind up or wind down, people began to say, you have wisdom. Oh. That, thing, that solution you gave me is working. No. It was people, I was not telling people I was wise. People were the ones telling me. That was my first dose of wisdom. Because I did not just sit down and wait. I was going through the process. Oh, I see knows now. We read books that time now. So have you read this book? Say, ah, this one, it's not just Bible teaching books. No, we read any book. Business, so, so I call it a good marketing book. Even though we didn't have any marketing plan. We were just reading. So the reason I'm saying this is that those things will help culture what God has planted in you. It's a plan. You must have a plan. So go and note. The building structures, and I know you just give you scripture reference for this. Genesis 26, 14 to 15, God told Noah to build an ark. And he told him the length of the ark, the height, the breadth. You know, you read that entire chapter, you will see. He told him how. Make window. Make this. In fact, when scientists and people who build boats examined this scripture, they found out that the measurement was so pristine that it was... Like building a submarine. That boat could truly, that measurement, if replicated, can truly build a boat that will survive a flood of that great magnitude. The, this ark that was built, this boat ark that was built, it, it cannot navigate. It was not built for that. It was not built, it was just survived the flood. It was what it was built for. And it worked. So it was not one guess work, just. Bring the wood like that, nail them here, God go do them, it's not God business. No, there was a plan. When they were about to build the tabernacle, what did Moses say to them, or what did God say to Moses? See to it that you make it according to the pattern shown you in heaven. That's a building plan. Joshua had a plan to, to, to conquer the land. He sent spies. You read, there's a part where Moses sent spies. I don't want to mention that one because there's a debate amongst apostles and prophets. That, oh, it was not God that sent them. This one is written clearly. Joshua sent them. And we know this one was a fruitful work. Because Rahab came out of it. And Rahab became a mother in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. You cannot question this one now. At least. You can. Those ones, they say, no, you should have, they should have just gone. You know, I, I they feared this. You know, this, the thing is that people feel that when you use your brain, God is not with you. So I leave them. I said, no, I will not argue this one with you. That one that Moses sent, bad fruits came out of it. So 
Maybe you are right. But Joshua's own was perfect. Joshua told them, in three days we shall cross the Jordan. And it happened as he said. Bless you. They had a plan. Now, I need to point out something remarkable about this planning. For many of you, you might think that planning is because the prospects are bright. No, it's not because the prospects are bright. It's because the word of the Lord is clear. Because when God told Noah to build an ark, he was not building the ark by the river. When God told Noah to build an ark, he was, not, he was building an ark for a rainfall that in the history of creation has never happened. A phenomenon that does not exist was what God told him to prepare for. God told him, build an ark, build a boat. He built it in the middle of the desert. Say, build a boat for a rain will fall. See, what is that word rain? Say, no, no, Jerry, I've not heard it before. God said, it's a phenomenon of water that would drop from the heavens. Say, eh, if you say so. It was not because the prospects were bright. It was because the word of the Lord was clear. So he made a plan towards it. When God told Joshua to cross the Jordan to go and conquer Jericho, remember that Joshua did not have a boat. But yet he sent spies to go and spy the land and come back. Some of you will say, me, when I don't get boats to cross, why am I going to spy the land? He sent spies into the land where they did not have a door to pass into the land. Stop waiting for everything to be clear before you start planning what you will do in obedience to the word of the Lord. I need you to think. So let me give you a practical example from our time. Imagine God tells you to prepare for winter in Nigeria, a land where snow has never fallen. That's what Noah was experiencing. Preparing for a phenomenon that does not exist. Say, ah, what will I do about this? How I, why will I be planning for this? It's because the Lord has spoken. It has happened during COVID. Somebody bought, I don't know about it's one or two or three or four container full of nose marks before it hit. He just heard China, they are doing this, they are wearing face masks. He just said, yeah, send us face masks. You know how much face masks were selling now, before and after? He was selling for 15 naira, 100 naira. Then by the time COVID came, he was selling for 500 naira. He was making profits. The guy doesn't go sit down somewhere, just making money. He prepared for a phenomenon that has not reached town. I don't know if God spoke to him, I'll give you an example, that's how it works. Preparing for a phenomenon you've not seen. What's your plan? Why wait till you have a boat before you plan to cross the Jordan? Why wait till you see rain? You think if Noah started building the boat when he now saw rain, you think he'd be able to succeed in that assignment? No. Because the rain didn't stop for about 100 days, if I'm not mistaken. But for at least it felt. So you'll be building, and the rain kept, as it was continuously falling, the water kept rising. So first of all, you have no place to stay. And you have no favorable weather to nail your wood. So if you wait till the sign is clear, it might be too late. First point of action for a man that believes is what? Planning. I'm going to make you the biggest fintech in the world. What is your plan? Number two, let's talk about some common things that are not so common about faith. Number two is prayer. He who believes will pray. I remember somebody hearing us praying about a word that we have received, a teenager, and he said, why are we praying? Should we God say we do it now? Let's leave it. It makes sense too. After the word of God does not fall to the ground. I wish you understood that word clearly. Fear will grip you. You will wish it could fall to the ground at least. You will wish. Because what it means is that when he says the word of the Lord will not fall to the ground, it means that if you don't fulfill it, somebody else will be used to fulfill it. That's what he said to Esther. He says, perhaps you are put in the kingdom for such a time as this. He said, however, if you will not rise to the occasion, salvation will come from somewhere else. It will still come to pass with or without you. It's your choice. So, let's look at a few scriptures. Look Chapter 18, from verse 1 to 8. Luke chapter 18, from verse 1 to 8. 
Remember my new strategy, I'm planning to finish my message in 40, 45 minutes. It's not my fault. I know many people will say, the people need to, no, don't worry, don't worry. Have you noticed that the great men of those days, Wigu's word, Ayobabalola, they didn't understand the Bible as much as the ushers of today. Our ushers today can school those men in the word of God. Where is the fruit of what you have received? Those men did exploit with the little they knew. So I will not give you one hour message again. That 40 minutes. If I can do 30 minutes, I will do it. Let us stick there. Let's see what we can do with what we have received. So I get revelation. No worry. No, it's not. I see. If I run, if, if God does not give me new revelation, the one He has given me, the ones I've, I have archived. If I just go and bring them, it will survive. It can, can last me for like 10, 50 years, if. Without recycling, it will, it will last me. To, there's no man called of God that dies exhausting his revelation. No man. There's no man called of God that exhausts the revelation he was given. You, you can exhaust the assignment, but not the revelation. Because God will give you something that's infinite. I have enough to last, but we're doing small, small, small. Luke chapter 18. I love this scripture. I need you to, when we finish reading it, please, or rather as we are reading it, take note of verse 1 and verse 8. Okay? So now, let's read. It says in verse 1, Then he spake a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not to lose hearts. King James says, and not to faint. So he wants to tell them a parable about prayer. Because that is the subject matter. Okay? So he told them the lesson before the parable. Verse 2, he then starts telling us the parable. Saying, there was a certain city there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. This judge, and let me just pause here, the judge here is not symbolic of God. He's symbolic of the principality over a territory. What this woman represents is the praying church in the territory. This is very important. So in this praying territory, she is trying to get victory over the adversary. But what is stopping her is the principality over the city. The reason we don't have result is because the custodians of a city might be against God. And therefore you pray and there's a challenge. It's very important to know this. Now that is one perspective of it. The second perspective I need you to gain about the scripture is that this scripture is a scripture of perspective. It's telling you that this woman, because of her difficulty in getting results, she sees God as what? An unjust judge. It's very important for you to know what your action says about God. She sees God as an unjust judge. But that aside, let's go back to our reading. Uh, today we're not explaining court systems in the spirit. It now says... Get justice for me from my adversary, and he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Verse 6 Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. So God does not delay. He answers what? Speedily. But he can bear long. Two things. He said, though he bear long with them, he will answer speedily. But that's not my emphasis. I just want you to note that as you go back to read these things on yourself. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? In other words, you prove that these people that there's faith on the earth, that there are people who can pray and not faint. In spite of the adversary. In spite of the adversary, people who can pray and not faint. Have you desired something from the Lord? After a while, you became used to it and gave up. I'll give an example of one. How many of you remember this pastor called? Pastor Vuji. I don't know how to pronounce that guy without hands and without legs. Nikki. Nikki, and the surname is very. 
okay, like tongues. Pastor Nikki has no hands, no legs. And one day I had a comment. He said he has bought shoes as a man who has planned because he believes one day God will heal him. If you notice his clothes, they are not cut off. They are folded in. So the day his hands will grow, yes, he will wear them. His trousers are not cut off. They are folded in. Trusting God that the day he will have legs, he will wear them. That's a man who has planned. But that man can one day give up, say, ah, 40 years, 50 years, I never get legs. I beg you. That's no longer fate. I'm not telling you that the end result that he will get leg. I'm talking about faith. I'm talking about, see, we will talk about power on that day. Today is faith. Faith is very important. Very easily misunderstood because that's the reason we have power without faith. Because we have equated power and faith. See, faith is power. Faith is resolved. Faith is this. This man can die. No leg, no hand. You, you go to heaven, you will see a mansion and a, 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 at his throne will be like a kingdom because he believed even to his dying breath. Because all of us want our reward here. Everything is here. You think when he gets to heaven, he will not have leg. He will not go to heaven and be rolling like all those uh, answer cripples. No, he won't. He will have leg. Is that not the fulfillment of his prayer? So in other words, there is a misunderstanding of faith that we have held on for so long. But God is looking for a people who will believe to the end. He said, he that believes to the end shall be saved. Very important. Very, very important. So he that believes will pray. Let's look at another scripture. Why else do we pray? Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26. He said, put me in remembrance. Let me content. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Put me in remembrance. Isaiah 43, verse 26. Put me in remembrance, says the Lord. State your case that you may be acquitted. What case is that? The case is one that God gave you. He said, put me in remembrance. That means there's something he told you that he wants you to remind him of. That thing that you're reminding him of is your case. So the case is not something that you developed on your own. It's something that God gave to you. And he's not saying, bring it to me. Remember, has God forgotten what he said? Is he capable of forgetting? No. But he's telling you, put me in remembrance. So God told you that he's going to expand you. He's going to promote you. He's going to deliver you. He's going to put you on the grand stage. And it's not yet happening. He says, put me in remembrance of what I've said. State your case. And you'll be acquitted. The word will come. You know my greatest fear for people? My greatest fear is that people will have results and not be given faith. Certificate. That's my greatest fear. Because people are so desperate, they don't understand the God that they serve. Do you know that the Christianity has philosophy? Oh, there was a day I was in Kingdom Series. I was, I was going to teach. Because I've done 15 episodes. I, could not, I can't continue Kingdom like that. I don't, 15, so I wanted to come into ideology. Ideology was planning. I was planning to take like three to five episodes to teach about Kingdom ideology. We don't, we have lost the kingdom ideology. That's why we don't, we can't think like God. We can't think like the believers. You know why? It was, it would have been manageable if we did not have the ideology of the kingdom and that place was a vacuum. But there's no vacuum there. We have a, a Greek Eastern philosophy that has replaced it. That philosophy, oh, I wish I could teach on that one also. To explain to you the philosophy that we are operating in in Christianity. Most, even the people who are good, the good ones, it has rubbed off on them, little by little. That's the reason we don't understand what faith is. For us, say, Ikechuku, where's your car? You don't have faith. We judge people by their now, by their experience. God is looking at the heart. He's weighing it on a different scale, and he sees faith, and he smiles. Do you know what he said in the book of uh, John? When he came back, when they came back from looking for food, he said to them, look, for the harvest is what? White. If he, you say four months in the harvest, I say it's already white as snow. He then tells them, enter into the labors of many generations. What does that mean? It means those many generations did not enter into their own labor. Summary speaking, they did not have the harvest of the seed they sowed. 
So they, they didn't have faith. They don't so see. They didn't ha- I'm entering on that message. Let me focus on today. Because this message is almost useless if that philosophy has not been replaced. The Eastern philosophy is very strong and it is embraced by every... In fact, we have teaching seminars on those philosophies, based on those philosophies. Have you not seen pastors doing laws, laws of attraction? That's an Eastern philosophy. It's not gospel. Fact is not truth. Next point in the acts of faith. If you believe, you will obey. Because certain prophetic words carry instructions. Not all of them carry instructions. Some of them carry only promises. So when you have a promise, your conduct might be different from the one who has been given an instruction. So God tells you, go and raise the dead. Say, make make a call first. (laughs) Do you understand? Let the people live first. No, he says, go and raise the dead. Take that action, that act of faith. Lay hands and say, in the name of Jesus, arise and walk. You must take an, a step of faith. Let me tell you a story. Years ago, I was in the city of Benin trying to survive. I was alone. I moved there with my family. And one by one, somebody would go to Abuja. Somebody would go to Shogbo. Somebody would go to Lagos. So I now now left in Lagos, in Benin alone. I had not gotten admission into school. I had prayed. God had spoken to me about school. And he said to me, wherever you go, my angel shall be with you. It was the angel that was talking to me in this vision. He told me, because I asked him, what school will I go to? Because he told me that I should do this work of assignment in the school. I told him, I don't know what school you want me to go to because I've been planning. I have strategized all kinds of schools. I've considered in the north. I've considered Port Harcourt. I've considered everything. And the angel of the Lord said, whatever school you go to, I will be with you. So I said, okay. Now I knew my plan was not all those permutations. Just anyone in my hand be rich. So I said, okay, what is the reasonable? Remember, I said anyone. It means it's not for me to now start thinking, start planning. So I planned Uniben because I was in Bini City. So I planned Uniben. My people now called me. I wrote a part-time exam. Result, while we were waiting for the result, my people called me and said they needed me. No, I didn't write part-time exam. I applied for part-time. So my people called me that last bone cannot be in Benin City all alone. Come, we have plans for you, school, work, and every single thing. Because I was working in a fast food. So they said to me that they had everything sorted out. I would not lose out on anything in Benin City. I wonder why they didn't use this incentive. They didn't remind me that Pearl was in Lagos. <laughs> but they didn't use that one. But that's what they told me. They promised me everything will work out. So I said, okay, yes, I'll come. I came back, and when I got to Lagos, you know what they told me? They said, I said, hey, what about that plan? They said, we're coming, we're coming. I said, okay, please, something fishy is going on here. What is the deal? They said, forget those things or nothing. Just come home. <laughs> no, you are too young to be alone. Ah! I was 22, 23. So I'm too young. Do you know when Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook? Where you know when these people are telling me, ah, the team paying me. So I didn't talk again. At, at that time, I had known them. So I didn't quarrel again. I didn't quarrel. I just kept quiet. I was heartbroken because you had a family meeting. They put us in a round table. I don't want to tell you the details of it because it, didn't, it still had break when I think about it. I've forgiven them. I don't think I've not. Uh-huh. They look at my leg and say, man, I've got no forgiveness. I've forgiven them since. I've not forgotten. <laughs> So, while I was there, somebody called me. Date for writing exam has come is today. Why are you just calling me? Bad friends exist, though. This same friend still did evil to me on that one, but let's leave that one. He now told me, today is the day for exam. I said, what? Really? Ah, and I began, how will I make it? Even from, in, you are living in Bini, you can arrive late and lose the exam. How much more from Lagos? Fortunately, they changed the date. So now I now became a lot. I was now calling. Since I now know the exam is near. I now found out the new date. I had no money. I began to call people. Remember God said he will be with me whatever university I go to. This is my own part of the deal. What action am I taking? My people didn't have money. Even if they had money, they were not going to give me. So I called somebody. 
called this guy. They now sent me recharge card to sell. Remember those days of selling recharge card that they would transfer to? <laughs> <laughs> so I sold the recharge card, took the money, in that bus, went to Benin City, wrote the exam, passed, got admission. Those simple, simple things is how God will evaluate your act of faith. It didn't happen supernaturally. Nobody, no car came to meet me. No supernatural money came to me. I acted on the word of the Lord. Moment. Many people will lose out on the things God has given them to do because they are waiting for it to manifest. It will not manifest for you. Remember, waiting is not part of your act of faith. You don't wait. You plan, you pray, you obey. So now we're talking about obedience. There are simple things that it will shock you. You will just do that little thing. It will not make sense. But it will change the entire landscape. For Pastor Bakari was having financial crisis and he prayed and said, Lord, what shall I do? God told him, go to one particular hotel in Sheraton and stand there. <laughs> How do you do that kind of thing? He didn't give you any. He just said, just go, go to the hotel and stand. He stood there. Nothing was happening. He now said, ah, now hunger goes, and the hunger now make me hear that thing. As I was about to go, he saw people quarreling, and God said, go and help the it's a white man and a black man. He said, go and help the white man. So he went there, said to quarrel, help the white man. Was that, yeah, this white man will come back and give me some dollars. And uh, the, the white man went upstairs, did not come. The hotel manager says, he, who is that white man? He said, I don't know. He said, what room is he staying in? Let me go and knock on his door and say, how far now I help you finish? Not he said, I don't know the room. And the man is leaving today. Ah! He can't even look whether God will speak. God didn't speak again. But before the man left, the man took Pastor Bakari's card. But Pastor didn't take the man's card. So there's no way for him to reach the man. Only the man will reach him. And that was the end. He went home and said, oh, but at least I did. I saw, I saw the quarry today. <laughs> it was weeks later, the man called from America and said they need a legal representative for them. And they booked a first class ticket for him to come over to America to get the full briefing and be the representative in Nigeria. That's how his life started to change. What was your instruction? Go and stand in front of a hotel like a fool. You know why we don't, we can't act in faith? We are too intelligent. We, we have too much prestige and dignity to protect. What can use you like that? Your faith will be crippled even before it starts. Simple what? Obedience. So let's look at a few scriptures. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 9 to 14. We will not read it because of time. I must meet my target. So in this scripture, a Syrian general of war came to Israel to look for the prophet, Elisha, and told him, I hear that you, are, you can heal anything. Now, your prayer is always answered. Here I am, leprous. Heal me. And Elijah told him, go to the river Jordan, dip yourself seven times, and you'll be healed. And the guy was like, how ridiculous. You don't have any jazz. You don't have any koboko to flog me. You know people like that one. Remember, there's a guy that came to my church in Kano when I was in Kano many years ago, and they preached for him. They told me that they laid hands on him. And I said, seriously, no frog jump. No king, nothing. <laughs> because he's coming for white garment where they used to beat shake out of their life. Even when there's no miracle in their life, you say, that beating, he get it. <laughs> he get what they do for my body. That's what was happening to the general. He said, you mean no punishment, just to go and swim in water, and the water is not even clean. So no, 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 this is not God. Not. The servant now said to him, if he had given you a hard thing to do, would you not have done it? Why are you now finding it difficult to do a simple thing? He said, that's true. Say, let us try it first. If you know what we know, say, we uh, went. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think carefully. Somebody in that state of mind, who they told to go to the Jordan to dip himself and says, I will not go. I feel insulted. I ended up not going. You think that's an act of faith? That's not, that's not faith. In our estimation, that's not faith. But for God, as long as you obeyed, that is faith. The man said, we have better rivers in Damascus. We have better rivers in Assyria. Why am I coming here to be baptized? That was, that was his estimation of the whole entire experience. So do you think he really believed emotionally, mentally? No. God was not checking that. 
There are days where God will tell me something and I'll say, ah, God, I know, I don't believe, but I, I will just act. Let's see on that scripture that proves that. Luke chapter 5, 4 to 5. I want you to read this one. The disciples had labored, tried to, to, to catch fish, and they will not catch fish. So Jesus Christ came to them and said, When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night. Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. That means, I don't believe, but because that you talk about making let me not disrespect you. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Singular. Half-hearted faith. God said, cast down thy nets. Plural. He cast down his nets. Singular. So when the net will now break, you now say, God is going to give you a net breaking miracle. That's a cost, not a blessing. It's like saying, God, we're going to give you a large church where people will be living every time. <laughs> if you are living, it's not a large church anymore. Do <laughs> you understand? He said, cast down thy nets. He said, we have told all night. We're professionals. You're a carpenter. What do you know about catching a fish? We have studied the current. We have studied the tides. We have studied the season. And we have done the work all night. And there's no fish to catch. So why do you think Fish will enter our nets. But I thy word. But I thy word. That's what God was looking for. Those who will say, but I thy word. That's how you obey in faith. But I thy word. Because you said so. Not because it makes sense. Not because it has, uh, what do you call it, industry standard. No, because you said so. That's all God is looking for. It's not going to make sense when he speaks to you. Because he's speaking from a higher dimension. He's seeing things you do not see. You are looking at the fact that this is not the time fish come. Fish come at night. They go at day. We are saying at day, I should cast. And Jesus Christ is saying, don't you think I can command the fish to come? You didn't think about that. You thought about only the, the industry standard. You didn't think about the creation standard. But there's a standard beyond the industry standard. There's a creator. He can, he can adjust things in your favor. So, our assignment is very simple. Obey. The Bible says in James chapter 1, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So, some people, they like, ah, they like prophetic meetings. They are going to prophesy again. Do you know what they said? Do you know what they said? What have you done with what has been said? I've seen people who have gone to a prophetic meetings come back See, it was powerful, it was powerful, powerful. But what did I don't think do that me go try that one. Let others try first. So take a leap of faith. And they will not take that leap of faith because it's a risk. But I want you to notice something consistent with Naaman and Peter's experience. That the instructions were ridiculous, but the result was miraculous. That is a Constant team with the operations of God. Do not evaluate the credibility of God's word on its sanity, on its make sense So that's how God evaluates things. That he said it, not that it looks sen sen sensible to you. You are not the judge of credibility. He is. So let's stick to that. Now, I think this is my last point. Yes, my last point is, if you believe you will do something else, God, meditate and hold on to the word. Ah! This is a very ridiculous path, posture to take for many people. You will meditate on that word. You will hold on to that word. And I will go ahead and read, I will start by reading that same scripture we just looked at in James chapter 1. And read it further than just being doers of the word. I want you to see something it says here. James chapter 1, verse 22. We'll read it down to verse 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. In other words, it's deception to hear and not do. Because you believe we are custodians of the word, because now it's not record them. I have the tape, I have the book. 
I have the memory. He says, that is not enough. Do. If not, you are deceiving yourself. Verse 23. Say, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. He forgets what he looks like. Do you understand? For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now I want you to note something else apart from the doing part. Is the part of looking into the perfect law of liberty. When God gives you a word, you must look into it. You must meditate on it. He says, you observe yourself in the mirror. The mirror is the prophetic word you have received. Observe. Oh, so this is what God is saying about me now. God is saying to me, I will pioneer something new. Oh, God is saying that I will handle something new. God is saying I will become something great. So you begin to have a new perspective of yourself. And the Lord is saying, do not forget this thing that you have seen. Many people don't go to the mirror anymore. God has said it. Now you know how I wanted you. That is, there's some truth to it. But that does not negate the fact that you must stay in the mirror and keep looking. Why? Because if you study the principle of the mirror in scripture, is that the image in the mirror and the person here are not the same. That's why you are going to observe to know what you are, so that you can become what you are meant to be. That's the principle. That's why the Bible says that we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are be- beholding his, his image, and we are being conformed into that image. We are conforming into the image that Christ is. That's why we look in the mirror, to conform to him. Do you understand this? So, God is going to give a revelation of himself that belongs to you. So, before you just thought of yourself as a doctor, and God now showing you. You are a teacher of the word. You are an evangelist of the word. You are a prophet of the word. You are an apostle of the word. He begins to show you dimensions of yourself. You are going to be a builder of institutions. You are going to be a repairer of institutions. You begin to have that new... You, it's like getting a new CV for yourself. You begin to know what God is saying concerning you. You are meditating on the word. Remembering what he has said concerning you. So that you can conform easily. I want us to look at another scripture, First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, and observe an important point here. Paul speaking to the Corinthian church says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. You are saved by the gospel you heard. You received and stood in it, and it's by it you are saved. If you hold fast that word, on what basis does the word save you? If you hold fast to that word. This is important. Let me explain to you why this is important. For many of us, we believe that the word saves us when we get to the end of the tunnel. You say, no, that you believe the word. That you held on to the word. You agreed with the word. That's what saves you. There is a part where the Bible tells you, he who endures to the end shall be saved. But there is a part where you believe in the beginning and are saved because you held on to the word. Many people don't hold on to the word that they have received. How do you hold on to the word? It's by that, looking into the mirror and observing daily. And saying, this is who I am. This is who God is saying I should be. This is who God is making me into. I want to look at another scripture again. This one is... The cardinal scripture for this point. It is 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21. Because there are three paragraphs and most people read them separate. The first paragraph says, do not quench the spirit. Second paragraph says, do not despise prophecies. And the last, third and last paragraph says, test all things, hold fast what is good. You might think there are three disjointed points, but they are not. He's telling you, do not quench the spirit. He's not telling you, how can you quench the spirit? 
when you despise prophecies. He now says, how can you handle it that you don't despise prophecies? He says, test it. Then when you finish testing it, hold fast that which is good amongst all you heard. Are you following this? Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Rather, what? Test all spirits. Hold fast that which is good. That is all God is asking of you. It's very simple. So what prophetic words have you received? What prophetic words have you heard? Can I share something with you? And please don't take this personal if this applies to you. Have you had an experience where you heard a prophetic word and when they ask you, do you believe the word? You then say, no, we may get the word. No, person, I hear that. Has it happened to you? Most people are like that. That is not the order of the kingdom. Let me give an example. Imagine you are a scientist. Oh, yeah, even a doctor. Let's use as a doctor. There is a new procedure. You didn't discover it. Then I ask you, does this procedure work? He said, no, we may discover it. Now, Pakistan, I discover Pakistan disease. So I don't know. Is that how medicine operates? No. When a knowledge has been discovered, what's the next thing? You test it. If it's true, it becomes part of the body of knowledge. Then people now learn it. In the kingdom, when things come from a divine vehicle, a prophetic word, an apostolic insight, a new teaching, a new insight comes to you, test it. Don't say, not be me, receive them. I don't know where it came from. When it happens, we will know. That's not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom is what? Test it. Hold fast, that which is good. Test it. Hold fast, what is good. Too many times, well, that's the reason we have created division in the body of Christ because you've received your own. Let me wait for me to receive my own. One day, a man of God gave a prophecy. One other great man of God now said, God has not told me that. Does God need your permission? Does God really need your permission to tell on that person something? That's why I told you, if I were in the prayer meeting yesterday, when I was praying and leading, I said, most of us are waiting to hear a voice, I say a vision. But God is speaking to us in deeper ways than visions. So when somebody receives a prophetic word, you test it, then a silent voice will now confirm it in your spirit. Then you will run with it. You say, write the vision, make it plain, so that he that receives the same revelation, no, but he that reads it, I'm reading it, and I will run with it. If everybody have to receive the vision like Habakkuk did, then nobody will read it and run with it. Only Habakkuk will have to run with it because only he received the vision. But he that reads it, how many of us are reading the word has been given? He that reads it will run with it. Write it. Make it plain. I tell people this thing. I remember I, I did a, a teaching on this on, on our WhatsApp state, uh, WhatsApp long time ago. That any truth that cannot be cross-examined is not truth at all. Just believe it. Just believe it. That's not what we are saying here. Test it. Examine it. Wait. Hold fast that which is true. Oh, he's a great man of God. He has never been wrong before. Test it. Wait. Hold fast that which is true. Many of us have not done that and we have failed in it. Exodus chapter 17, verse 14 to 16. After they had defeated Amalek, when Moses stood on the mountain, lifted up his hand, holding the rod of God, and Amalek was defeated completely, the word of the Lord came to Moses. Said, then the Lord said to Moses, verse 14, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. That is like saying, the Lord is my marching order. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Look at that. Beautiful scripture. God said, write this prophetic word that I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Write it. Put it in a book. Rehearse it. It's one person who uses the word. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. You know what rehearsal means? Keep reciting, re-practicing consistently. 
rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, recount it in his ears over and over. That's what we do with prophetic words. We remind ourselves of these things. This is what God said. This is what God said. This is what God said. We remind ourselves of these things. And sometimes God will not speak any word to you. Speak to him. You receive the word. You read it. You run with it. You will test it. You hold that fast, which is true. And you will now begin to rehearse it. But we forgot the word. We are waiting. Say, faith is to wait. No. That's the ways of the skeptics. Let us wait and see. Shall we then tell you this will happen? Let us wait and see. No, the people of faith, they have their plan. They plan towards it. They plan towards it. What are businesses that are not working now that are good for Nigeria that you think should be working? And you believe that a new Nigeria will make that business blossom? Start investing in it. Start investing in it. I heard that should be Nigerian government are climbing down on crypto and making it difficult. If crypto is good, I don't know. I'm not a crypto person. If it's good, start planning for crypto for the new Nigeria. That's how you know you have faith. What is the prospect that this thing has for a new Nigeria? The roads are not good. Some places we cannot go. Start planning meetings. Say September will be in Bauchi. In October will be in Meduguri. Because you know a new Nigeria is coming and those places it's possible to get there. You'll be the first. You'll get things the cheapest. You'll be the one to sell to others. It happened to Jeremiah. He had a dream and he saw his uncle come to him, telling him to buy a land for a cheap price. And the Lord then told him, buy it. See, people will see buy land in this land, in this country again, when they come back from the Exodus. And at that time, you will have it at a premium price. You will not be selling. God is showing him the field. If he sees him, he made a confess. No, he bought it. He has faith. Preparing for the unforeseen future because God has spoken it. So God said to him, rehearse these words in Joshua's ears over and over again. And Joshua was also given the same similar word in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, the famous scripture where we will end our reading and for today. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, for but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have good success. So we meditate. One thing that meditation does that most of us are not aware of is transformation. So let me give you an example. Let's say you are barren of any kind of barrenness, financial, um, what's biological. And the Lord then tells you, you have a son, you have a child. Meditate on the word. Begin to remind yourself, God said I will have a child. God said I will be fruitful. God said I will be fruitful. You keep reminding yourself. So when things happen, you plan towards it. Okay, let's see. Should we buy unisex clothes? Say, ah, well, are you not bad? I say, don't worry about that. I, I have info that you're not aware of. You begin to plan towards it. What is happening is that in the meditation of that word, the womb begins to come alive. That word meditation. It says, meditate in a day and night that you may observe to do. It gives you ability to do afterwards. You were not able to do before. But you're meditating, the ability to do now begins to come. For things to manifest, you need to meditate on the prophetic word. So what has God said to you? What has God said concerning this season, concerning your calling, concerning your life, concerning your family? What has God said? It's in the midst of that meditation that the word begins to take in the flesh. This is how we build living faith. And I don't want you to miss it. Because so many people have taken the wrong steps. People have gone to meet alternatives. I don't want to talk about the negative part. I want to focus on the positives for now. How do we act in faith? We plan. We pray. We obey. And we hold fast the word of God. Hold fast that word. Meditate on it. Speak it into your life. Speak it into the air. Discuss it with your prayer partner. Discuss it with your Covenant brothers and sisters. 
Share that word. Don't let anybody tell you uh, this thing they are saying is a very delicate, strange thing. You know, I remember one day somebody saw my prophetic word on YouTube and he just called me. He said, ah, man of God. Ah. He, he could not, because of his respect for me, he could not say, what if the word fails? He just said, ah, that was bold, though. That was, ha, huh? you try, you. I respect you. Hey, that kind of word, you know. <laughs> it was in that really tragedy. Really, what if you fail? Will you delete it for you to be there? Do you understand? There are people who will tell you, don't declare these things outside. It's not the way of the Lord. Let us stay away from that feeling. I wish, see, the philosophy is too much. You know what the philosophy is? In school, we have department of philosophy. It's an institution. They have class upon class. You have to level one, level two, level three, level four. You now graduate, you now get certificates. How what philosophy is. So it's not an easy thing to just break the philosophy of devils in the church. There's a war. So I should, I should, I should preach one message that destroys. No, that's how it works. People need to be educated about the philosophy of the kingdom, the ideology of the kingdom. There's a way we act in this kingdom. There's a way we think in this kingdom. But it has been lost for many generations. But this is the assignment God has given us. One of the things we are restoring is the ideology of the kingdom. And God will give us the space to teach on it. No, see, we cannot let this... See, you know one of the covenants I made with God this year? I said, God, I will preach the gospel, the fullness of it that you have given me. Before, I'm always careful. I say, ah, are they ready? No, somebody is ready. I don't know who the person is. I will, just be, I will be declaring it. Sometimes, I'm not like you. One of the reasons I didn't so preach some words like, ah, my preaching skill is very poor. So this deep, powerful message, I can't preach and with this my inexperienced style. I don't have, I said, no, I'll preach it. I will declare the word. West, because we need to make a change in the entire paradigm that the Christian race is operating. There, there's so much error. The, the true men of God have the error. Many of them have it because the philosophy was passed down from generation to generation. Ideologies of devils. So we have work to do, and God will help us. 